And I'll make the pitch that if you're watching, um, uh, this is a fundraiser for AQR and Ron doesn't really like to ask, um, but um, if you enjoy this, uh, please consider making a donation to AQR to keep it, keep it going. So um, um, I'm gonna read um, uh, from, from this book, uh, uh, Green Alaska, Dreams from the Far Coast, um, a little bit, uh, particularly in um, honor of, of um, Eva Salidas, uh, two chapters that have to do with uh, marine mammals. Um, uh, this, this book is, um, uh, relates to the Harriman Expedition of 1899, and it's an older book for me. I wrote it, it was published in 1999, um, and um, uh, just for background, the, the, Mr. Harriman was the railroad guy um, who took his family on a vacation to Alaska for two months on this ship all along the coast and invited about 30 other um, uh, scientists and artists and writers to accompany him. Um, <clears throat> and. Um, uh, the two of the two of the writers were were John Burroughs and John Muir, who were the foremost nature writers of their time. So, so for my book, I retraced by fishing tender um, just a little bit of their route from Homer, and I, I I'm coming to you from Homer. I live in Homer, um, out to the end of the Alaska Peninsula, um, and then uh, wrote these little short chapters about my relationship to coastal Alaska and then sort of reimagining part of the expedition, kind of going back and forth in time. Um, so I think of the little, the little chapters as sort of meditations. Um, and the first one, uh, the first one is called Wake Riders. <clears throat> I stand on the tender's bow, leaning forward, hands gripped tightly to the rail, at 10 knots, we're plowing through the sea, parting it with a sound like crushing paper. Below me, out of the vast blue, porpoises slice in from left and right. They catch the push of the bow's wake and then shoot across one another and cut back into the wake again. Now their dorsal backs split the surface with steam kettle hisses. Now their white patched sides flash. It must be like surfing, I think only below the surface. There's no question these animals are at play with the boat and one another. They're long for the ride. These are dolls porpoises. Among the fastest of any marine mammals, they're known for appearing out of nowhere to ride the bow wakes of ships. Their black and white markings are distinctive. The white edges to the dorsals and flukes like matched accessories to their patches. As a rule, they get little attention from humans. They don't leap from the sea like other porpoises and they don't survive well in captivity. No one knows how many there are. They accompany ships in a range that runs from the Bering Sea all the way down to the Northern California coastline. To coast. They have sharp teeth and eat a diet of squid and mollusks as well as fish. The Harriman expedition was William Dahl's 14th trip to Alaska. On his first in 1865, he'd led an expedition to study the feasibility of an intercontinental telegraph line. Later, he had authored Alaska and its resources, still in 1899, respected as a major, perhaps the major source book for the territory. Doll's porpoise, doll sheep, doll limpet, and several other species, all named for the man who first scientifically identified them. Dahl was the expedition's general lecturer about Alaska's discovery, exploration, and resources. He was frank about the Russian exploitations, critical of the 30-year American occupation he considered one of anarchy, neglect, and indifference. I hear him proclaim what he later set in print for Mr. Harriman, quote, a history of conditions in Alaska from 1867 to 1897 is yet to be written, and when written, few Americans will be able to read it without indignation. The small whales cross and recross our bow, all quicksilver motion and light, two of them, or five or six or eight in view at a time, 
Their pace seems effortless. Again and again, they appear to come within inches, an inch of crashing into the bow, of colliding with one another, but they never do. They are speed and precision artists. Then, just when I think I know something about the way doll porpoises behave in a bow wake, five of them together torpedo up from the depths at one side of the bow. Before they hit the surface, they peel off from one another, arching back in black and white symmetry, opening the formation like a flower, like fireworks, like acrobatic fighter jets or synchronized swimmers in perfectly choreographed performance. They spray through the surface, then circle under and they're back, they're back to riding with the bow. Uh, so the next one that follows, um, it's called Devil Fish. And it's got an epigraph from John Burroughs who wrote the narrative of the expedition. And that reads, many whales were seen blowing, their glistening backs emerging from the water, turning slowly like the periphery of a huge wheel. How right he has it, he has it. A surfacing whale cuts the water with such an arc, turning, 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 that you think the animal must be circular. We meet our first large whales in Shelikov Strait. They're off to starboard, but so distant, all we can see is they're blowing. They must be gray whales, which tend to hug the coastlines in their long migrations between Baja, California, and the Bering and Chukchi Seas, and which have shorter, more dispersed blows than the humpbacks. These vaporous breaths hang over the pitching sea before drifting like mist to the wind, in the wind. No sooner has one dissipated than another shoots up and then two together, establishing not a pattern exactly, but a sort of pinball rhythm. I think of my child self, how I was in New England how I was New England raised on sea shanties. The countless times I shouted, there she blows. I was crazy for those three words, for the archaic and windy sound of them and for the excitement they conveyed. An excitement that was somehow caught up in my mind with peg-legged pirates and treasure chests. I hadn't the dimmest idea when I shaded my ideas with my open hand and pretended to peer into the distance that what I meant to see was anything like what is beside me now. It was, not, <clears throat> it was not until I read Moby Dick as an adult that I understood the first thing about sighting whales at sea and then it came like a revelation. Oh, blowing a whale. Devilfish, the Yankee whalers called them. More than other whales, the greys were protective of their young and were said to attack boats that got between mothers and calves. Even so, these slow moving whales were no match for the whalers and their harpoons. The Atlantic greys were wiped out entirely by the 1700s. The Pacifics pursued to the brink in the next century. I picture the harem and women traipsing out onto glaciers in their long skirts. Of what were their corset stays and skirt hoops made and their umbrella handles? For centuries, there had been nothing else in the world so flexible and resilient as baleen, those fringed and horny plates from the great whales' mouths. Only when whales became too rare and baleen too expensive were merchandisers forced to invent substitutes, eventually plastics. By the time, the Harriman by the time of the Harriman expedition, too few gray whales were left anywhere in the world to hunt. And the last hungry whalers were concentrating on Arctic bowheads. The whales Burroughs saw in Southeast Alaska were likely humpbacks and others of the party watched killer whales in Prince William Sound. But the expedition didn't encounter the whaling fleet itself until Port Clarence, far in the Northwest. There, the few ships still working waited for the ice pack to open enough for them to reach the bowhead summering grounds and last refuge discovered just 10 years before. My breath holds in my chest as I scan for the next explosive sign of whale. I breathe out slowly, in, out. We're not simply a lone boat floating on, on a rolling blue, blue surface. We're part of a complex, largely hidden vertical life inhabited by whales the size of ships, single-celled diatoms, 
crab larvae and barn door halibut, swarming schools of pollock, salmon sniffing their way home, sea stars, sea lettuce, sea lions, seagulls, snooty shearwaters, and squid. We're traveling together, all of us, dependent whether we know it or not, on one another and the good health of our ocean home. The puffin dives after the herring and the otter relies on the kelp for anchor and the incoming salmon feed on the outgoing salmon fry as the salmon fry eat of the old dead spawners. Our boat is off to the fishing grounds no less than the old whalers were off to the whaling grounds, though we know the difference between whales and fish and the need for both to prosper. Beside us on their parallel course, the fearless barnacle ridden whales are off to their summer grazing in fields of amphipods in this season of fattening. <laughs>